46 million Nigerian children out of school, says NITDA. The National Information Technology Development Agency on Thursday put the number of Nigerian children forced out of school as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic at 46 million. NITDA's Director General Kashifu Nua disclosed this while speaking during a stakeholders meetup and hangout webinar organized by his agency. He said 24,372 active students were learning on the NITD Academy via its virtual platforms to help improve the skills of students at home as a result of the outbreak of the virus. He said the theme of the events leveraging indigenous technologies to enhance education development was aptly chosen because the COVID-19 pandemic had negatively impacted educational system in Nigeria and across the globe. Joining us now is Emmanuel Etim, former presidential candidate, CN CNP. Thank you for joining us. Hello, morning. Thanks for having me. Okay. Yeah, we see that 46 million out-of-school children is a huge number for especially a very relevant African country like ours. How can we solve this problem? Well, before now, um, we've always had the challenge. In fact, UNICEF had told us in 2015 that one in, five, one in five children out of school around the world was a Nigerian child. Uh, and then we also knew that that was a cultural and traditional challenge for us as a country. However, right now, post-COVID-19 has created a new reality. And that reality means that children are not just out of school because of the social, cultural, economic, and maybe political reasons, including um, situations of conflict. But right now, um, structurally, children will be out of school because they lack access to data and their appropriate technology, not just in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of cost and in terms of capacity to use. Um, given the struck the kind and the way we learn today. So it's, it's going to be a real serious problem because uh, when we began the journey of the SDGs in 2015, the, the mantra was leaving no, no one behind, especially children. Um, whether children who are often vulnerable or children you know, born with difficult, um, with, you know, with needs, or, or children who learn differently. With COVID-19, that problem is going to become even more widened and exasperated. So we are in a difficult situation and a most challenging one for that matter. And it's important that an organization as NIDA has come to, you know, to make that problem uh, a core issue that we all should, 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 should address. Mm. Now, the pandemic has uh, negatively impacted Nigeria's educational system, especially with learning going virtual. Uh, this is another area of concern. So how can, how can we creatively change learning to feed and benefit everyone? I think that we haven't yet addressed the, change, the question of learning because of COVID-19. Before COVID-19, we've always had the pandemic, the, you know, educational pandemic. The world moved away from critical, you know, critical thinking as a way of learning in the 70s to design thinking as a way of learning. Um, we had not even grasped critical thinking yet. And I'm saying this because uh, we have, when we say the, you know, education has gone virtual, that's not our reality. Um, education has not even become education for us. Uh, there's something called the andragogy of learning, which is how people learn and the most effective way to learn. And, and many children are out of school, not just because um, they don't want to learn, just because they learn differently. That already keeps millions of children out of school. Now we have COVID-19 that is requiring that, you know, to a large extent, learning goes virtual. We're going to see maybe probably more millions of children out of school when that reality hits us. And the way to change that, it literally means we have to reform the way our educational system was structured in the very beginning. In other words, the foundation for which we established how to learn, why we learn, and what we are learning for in Nigeria, maybe the across the continent, needs to be restructured and reformed. In fact, um, probably rethought from the very beginning. And how to do that is going to be a very big challenge because we're in the middle of a crisis and uh, not, not to, you know, use, not to allow that, you know, uh, put us in a situation where a lot of people are out of school at the gap. So this is a big challenge for, for leadership right now. Mm. Now, internet learning seems to be the future of learning uh, globally, but in a country like Nigeria with uh, low internet penetration, what should the government be looking at improving right now to catch up with the rest of the world? And, and this, that's why I say, you know, in a country like Nigeria, I always talk to, everything is an emergency. 
So it's hard to say this is more important than the other. So um, development, uh, consistent development across board, you know, whether in terms of infrastructure or in terms of um, investment, social investment, they are all important. 46.6% is our current data international penetration date. But even for that 46%, there's also the question of cost and affordability. There's also the question of speed. Because when you want to take learning virtual, there's the question of data cost. There's the question of who pays that cost. There's also the question of how, um, how, much, how much data is available. I hope you know that when you go outside of Lagos and even to Abuja, the you know, data connectivity is a big challenge for Nigerians. Um, if you're not having slow connection, you're having your connection trip off, or you're not able to process information on time, and when you can do that, you're paying such a huge amount of money for doing so. And this is because sometimes when policies may not take into consideration the, the capacity of most Nigerians and how much they can earn. I hope you know that over 60% of Nigerians, the working population of Nigerians, which is just 17% of the, the adult population, or the working population, doesn't earn anything more than 300,000 naira or thereabout, between 300 300,000 and 700,000 naira. How much does internet data cost? The basic use of the internet in Nigeria and data access is about 20,000 naira for those who can afford it. How, so the person earns 300 to 700,000, probably earns less than 60,000 naira a month as salary. And I'm saying this for those 70% who are employed. So the question is, where are the larger population of Nigerian children living? How do they, most of this, even, even this phone penetration rate you're talking about that is low, it's not just low, it's catastrophically low because where they have it, the phones and devices they use can't even connect to the internet. For some of them, they can barely use WhatsApp on them. So what I'm trying to say, in other words, is that this is a conversation that must leave the corridors of those who have access and privilege to the reality that the majority of Nigerians face. So when, when we have this conversation, let's be real. Let's not have it because we can do this now. Let's ask ourselves, what kind of access do Nigerians have, in, even in that low internet, internet penetration rate? Those realities are important in policymaking. And this should be brought to the table of discussion. Look, we've been speaking on general terms regarding out-of-school children in Nigeria, but we know that the majority of that number are in the north. How do you think the government can address that peculiar and particular situation? So without, without mixing up the conversation, there's been um, efforts by the present government before this, before this government with uh, you know, a policy framework that was you know, uh, framed as um, all in school by 2015, and with this government, there's been, um, you know, at the presidential level, there's been effort to the school feeding program to get more children in school and to keep them in school. And there's been problems through the state and federal education, a basic education program to build more schools and expand infrastructure, train teachers, refresh your courses, provide incentives, incentives. What I'm trying to say is that all of this has been done, address issues of gender, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, gender practices or discrimination that keep young girls out of school address the issue of poverty. So a lot of that has been done, we recognize. But then, in, because you talk about specifics, so those specifics are there. And in the North East, um, or the North in general, you may say, okay, maybe because um, you know, our formal educational system does not very well align with the Islamic education system, but then the North is not just it's only you know, um, about that. So I'm saying that Whilst those are realities, and a lot of billions of naira have been budgeted and allocated to address this problem, the post-COVID-19 challenge may reverse all the gains we've made in those areas. And that is why the specific focus on how we will reposition and restructure and realign how we learn in Nigeria, what we learn for, and, and to what direction we learn has to become on the table. In other words, like I said earlier, the andragogy of learning should become part of how we design our educational curricula and what we want people to become when they go through, you know, through educational system. These days, you can learn without even going to classroom. I mean, not in terms of, you know, having internet education, but you can have access to the information you could have had in the classroom with a teacher from different sources around the world. But that is just going to serve a very small population of Nigerians, whether they're in the north, they're in the south, or they're in the east. The, ch the structural challenge of going learning virtually is going to affect all Nigerians, whether in the north, in the south, or in the east, or you know, um, in the west. Hmm. We understand that uh, a large number of this uh, out of school children statistics uh, that has just been released is uh, due to the COVID nineteen pandemic and lockdowns uh, globally and in Nigeria. So post COVID, how do you see re enrollment in schools? Do you see uh, maybe the enrollment increasing? 
Well, I don't know if the enrollment would increase, but I do know that um, uh, the, the the challenge with post COVID nineteen school reentry um, is being solved in different parts of the world, and we can already see good practices that are coming out from there. Um, we already have a problem where even the schools, the way we, like I said again, the 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 the, the design thinking about in our environment, in how we implement policy recommendations and how we provide infrastructure for the everyday Nigerians. It's a big job, it's a gap, it's a challenge. And this is because um, uh, uh, the, the, the socioeconomic arrangement and structure of Nigeria has created a huge gap between the extremely rich and extremely poor. Some people try to create statistics to say we have a middle class. We don't have a middle class in Nigeria, we don't have. We just have poor people who have money at some point in time to spend like the rich. That's all we have. And so, the, the school enrollment challenge we're going to have it means that while a lot of parents will be excited to send their kids to school, we're going to see a lot keep their children back at home, hoping to see what happens next. The reality of COVID-19 in the rural areas where we have the majority of children living is not as serious as we have it in urban centers. So we might see an influx of children re-entering the school without even, you know, whether social distancing, which even those who are educated are not practicing as it were, or the resources to afford the mask. I mean, as cheap as a mask may be, or a face shield may be, it is still very expensive for many Nigerian children who come from very impoverished homes. So uh, the, the question then is, will these costs be transferred to the children, or will the state pick up those costs, or will it, you know, philanthropists come and pick up those costs? When even the provisions of the state education program was made free, or is still made free, or the universal basic education program is free, Parents were still paying for that in certain areas. And even when they were not they were supposed to pay, they did not know it was free. So the question that parents are going to be asking is, I'm going to send my child back to school. Who will cover the cost of the face mask, the shield, or the additional cost of providing those protections that the children may need while to be in school? That's the question that needs to be answered. And that's the question that needs, if there is a program and to respond to that, then it has to be part of the, you know, the communication that's going on right now and aggressively as well. Wow, those are very important issues. You've highlighted them, Mr. Etim. Thank you for joining us on The Breakfast this morning. Thank you for having me on your breakfast show this morning. Thank you.